question. What was it like to work for Fox Fox all then? They were some of the nicest people I've ever worked with. Uh, I know that they are not held in the highest regard uh, for the stuff that they do to uh, their production, but the people that actually did the work were some of the nicest people I've ever known. Um, it was nice, steady, recurring work, so they'd have me in a couple times a week, and it was just a pleasure to work with. And they're kind of still there doing other stuff, and they get to call me to be done with it. Question? How did you get audition for Fast and I, uh, by the time I had started doing it, I was auditioning for Eggman. I was on the Pokemon uh, for Kids talent roster. I had been there for a couple of years, started in 2002, so by about 2004, they had a secret meeting to announce, we have a special thing called Project X, we can't tell you what it is, but what it turned out to be was Summit X, and they turned out to be very interested in having the audition to be Dr. Eggman. So they brought me in for my first audition, they gave me samples of Dean Bristow, the original guy to listen to, and he puts him down here talking about this, right, 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 right. So he said, sound like that guy. So I went to a lot of trouble to, to practice sounding right, 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 right. So I went in and auditioned, nothing for a couple of weeks, and then got called back in for a callback. Went back in, did exactly the same thing. Right, 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 right. Went, uh, another two weeks went by, third time, called back, do it again. Right, 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 right. Apparently, third time's the charm. They finally said, hey, great, we'll take you. You're the new Dr. Eggman, which was awesome. And uh, the rest, as they say, was history. Except that I had to re-audition for my role two years ago, three years ago now, uh, when we did the big recast, uh, replacing all of my New York friends with my new Los Angeles friends. And they were kind enough to ask me to re-audition, and yeah, so it's great to be back. Question? What was your favorite Eggman line to record? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, uh. Rather than a favorite uh, line, I would have to pick a favorite moment, which was from Sonic X, uh, which, by the way, I also played another day. Um, yes, take a moment to let that sink in. Um, there was a moment where Dr. Eggman answers the phone from a viewer, which is impossible on so many levels, but he answers the phone with a hearty, hello, <laughs> just made me laugh. <laughs> uh, question, young man, then. When you said that you're working on I can say I'm working on another Sonic project. <laughs> okay. Has there, has there been anything released since the cast change? Oh, yes. There have been uh, Sonic Colors, uh, Sonic Generations, um, and the Sonic Crew Riders, and the uh, All-Star Racing was all the new cast. So, yeah. But there's even more new and exciting stuff, theoretically, happening in the new year. Please stay tuned. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. Questions? 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 Question. What's your favorite uh, part of the story arc for Sonic X? That's also an excellent question. I actually liked right near the very end of the, the series, the last few episodes, where Eggman got to actually show some emotion, which, I mean, apart from the big emotion that he usually shows, um, they had, we had an emotional moment with everyone's least favorite character, Chris Thorndike, uh, as Chris was leaving town or whatever he was doing. and. I actually got a chance to bring Eggman into a more human range and show some genuine affection for this kid in the life. But it was nice to be able to show at least a slightly different bit of emotion for the character. Question? Question. What was your favorite game to work on? My favorite game to work on? Uh, it's, it's going to be a toss-up between Sonic Colors and Sonic Generation. With Colors, they started to add lots of comedy. I love comedy. So the PA announcements, which were very popular in the game, uh, were part of Sonic, Sonic Colors. And in Generations with that, for example, that last scene right there that we just enjoyed, I hope, uh, that was also very fun to do. Even though it was just me in a room talking to myself, but I do that anyway. Question? <laughs> You're also Blaze's arch enemy, a man Nega, right? Yes, I am. Briefly, so I have, I don't have no specific yeah. memory of recording that, but I know it is. Yeah. I like the line in Generation to me, so am I really going to be that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That was great. Yeah. Lots of fun to do that. Question. When you do record the CLA deal, do you do it in a New York studio? or? Usually, yes I do. Usually I'm in some random New York studio. I fancy digital ISDN line, which is basically like talking to people on the phone. You can hear them, they can hear you, you can't see them. You have no idea what they're... When, when you're in a studio and they're at least people on the other side of the glass, 
They may turn off the microphone and talk about you, which is a fun experience, but at least you can get some idea from body language, whether it's, or you have a hunch of what they're talking about. But this is a lot of, we'll be right back. Okay. Uh, I have had the pleasure of being uh, sent out to Los Angeles for one more second, about which I cannot speak. But usually, I'm here and there. It's much nicer when I'm in, but you know. Good question. How often did you have to read your lines? The Eggman games, they are really good about getting what they want the first time. Um, with Sonic X, fixes were a very common thing. And because we're recording week after week, I come in one week, and then two weeks later, they'd look at it and say, we got fixes from the episode from before, come in and read these. So by, I don't know if these, the people that are now pushing the games are that much better at it. But they are at least planned better in the games they want the first time. Question? Question? Uh, when you're recording, do you ever run out of that and as your voice player out eventually, uh, have to take a break? Yeah, I'll get little, like 10 minute breaks in between recording. Usually the biggest problem is that there's a lot of yelling. It's just like yelling at anyone, even though there are better ways to yell that are, will be less damaging in the long run. In the short run, yelling will take a toll on the voice. So uh, my sessions generally run about four hours for right now, and after the four hours of yelling, I also like this anyway, so I have the first time. It recovers after a day or so. Question? Have you ever lost your voice completely after a recording session? Not after a recording session, but I had a month-long battle with laryngitis uh, in, I'm guessing it was about the early Sonic X period. So if you listen carefully, there were some episodes where Hell of the Nate sounds more like Dr. Eggman. I am Hell of the Nate! Um, but now I'm under the care of a very uh, talented uh, ear, nose, throat guy who he'll fix that next time. But don't be afraid of doctors, he is. Doctors can be afraid. Question? Do you just randomly decide to do the voice in public? Like if you just do something and you decide, I'm just going to do it next time? Usually, no. I mean, I've walked by kids with, with, with Sonic t shirts on the street. And lately, I've decided, let's just let that go. But the thought has crossed my mind. Question? Question. Uh, Mark, it has to do with the, um, with, um, uh, Pokemon. Mm -hmm. That, uh, um, have you, have, um, and that your, um, son, um, told me that, um, that he, that you did his, um, power on, um, that, um, what would you say would be your favorite Pokemon, in the, um, in the whole series? Um, I've only worked with, does one say one works with Pokemon? Is that sure. fun? <laughs> no, Roger. Um, I have worked at Sipaldon, so he's got a, a special place in my heart. I did an episode as this completely uh, forgettable grandfather character. But he ran a uh, carrier Pidgey service, so I like the Pidgeys since I did a show with them. Um, I did another episode as a guy who lives in a mansion that's uh, um, infested with shroomish, so shroomish are uh, our special friends of mine. And my uh, first uh, Pokemon episode, where I played the nondescript grandfather, uh, I didn't see the Pikachu, so definitely. We we shared. This. <laughs> Question. Question. So the, the voiceovers that you do for Pokemon are sometimes they seem like giant mountains of exposition that go on forever and ever. That must be awesome for you in terms of work. But how do you approach that? Do you like to make breath marks? Is there, does the director tell you it needs to be at this tempo or that tempo? Or you have to squeeze this whole paragraph in in under 30 seconds? For the narrator, which by the way, I was the interim narrator. Here's my little footnote to history. Uh, the original narrator, a uh, lovely man named Roger, was the narrator through oh, a couple of years before uh, Pokemon uh, switched from Orchids to elsewhere. Um, and he kind of skipped out of the gig for some reason or other, and they said, here, do this. So I was the narrator for a couple of years until Pokemon went away, and he got his own job back. So I am the interim narrator. Um, but the narrator, because it's completely off screen, is all time-based. So they say, we've got 24 seconds for this, go. We'll read it, and it will say, eh, speed it up a little bit, or the engineer will go cutting and pasting, slicing and squeezing, and making it a bit better. But sometimes I'll mark breath spots, or other times I'll start reading and realize, hey, I'm running out of breath before. And then they'll just try it again. The delete button is your friend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question? Question? Yes? Where do you get the voices that you use? I mean, you 
Fukushima now, you've got a couple of different voices here. You're talking up, you're talking down. Is that something that a director gives you a lot of time, or is it something that you pick up from the people around you? That's a great question. It needs a little, a little bit of both. The director will usually have some idea about what sort of voice they want. Uh, for example, I remember one of my big auditions, one of my first ones was Luke like the Muscle. And uh, the lovely Eric Stewart was uh, doing the casting and directing. And uh, he brought me in and said, We have this character, we're not really sure what kind of voice we want. He's just a little, little guy in a diaper. But we're thinking, maybe he should sound like a truck driver. Oh, I know. <laughs> hey, how you doing? I'm Meat. It's Ultimate Muscle. Hey! <laughs> and it turned out that was the voice they loved, and that was awesome. And that was purely based on the director's suggestion. But it was a voice that I had obviously heard because living in the New York area, you hear people like that. Yep. So they're definitely based in reality, but there are also people all around. I listen to the radio a lot, and especially listening to New York talk radio. And hi, there's always people calling and talking like this. So I've learned to talk like that. I have uh, various relatives that I will uh, listen to and do impressions of when they're not looking, and they always uh, yeah. turn themselves into new voices. So it's a combination, depending on what the director wants and what I can find in my head, or just by playing around. The technique I like to find is bad impressions become good new voices. I don't do them, I don't necessarily do the world's greatest Ar uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I can do a bad Arnold Schwarzenegger, and if you don't say, oh, this is a bad Arnold Schwarzenegger, you say, oh, this is some new character I've dreamed up. Listen. And that works well. Question? New York Radio, so did you ever listen to the late Lynn Samuels? Oh, sure. What did you think of her voice? That was a voice. I knew Lynn I, not very well, but I met her several times because I uh, did some voice work at Sirius uh, XM where she works. I can't talk about what I do there, but I wish I could. But if you listen enough on various channels, it's fine. What channel do you Somewhere in the Triple H channels. Um, Lynn, Lynn had this very New York sort of voice, and she just sounded like this. And she was a lovely woman, but she sounded exactly like this on the radio and off the radio. So sometime I might find cause to use Lynn's voice for a character. And I, would, I hope she would consider that a great honor. She would use it. Do you do accents very often? Yes, very often. Um, not as often as I'd like, but uh, for example, the Viva Pinata spot. I was the narrator for Viva Pinata. Welcome to Big Stretch Pinata Island. So there is that. Uh, uh, that was that was British. There, there, there's the upper class British. And it's also coached by Scotty British. And there, every once in a while, needs to call that. And it was very much that way. Scotty British. Scotty British. Scotty British. I can do the Scottish look. So why did it call if it comes up in conversation? It hasn't really. I did it once for a cartoon called International Airport, but I named a whole bunch of random animals. I think it's running in some other country, and there was just some random like messenger dog. I said, pick a voice. I had Scottish running in my head, so it was that. And I'll be narrating an audio book about the Nazis uh, in a couple of weeks, so I'm learning lots of German words. That'll be fun. Question. What was your first voice acting? My first voice acting gig, it, run, it runs in stages. I would consider my radio career, which ran from For Money, 1986 through 1994, actually on the radio here, the and then I was behind the scenes in a radio prep service doing comedy bits and, and stuff behind the scenes, but still doing voice. The first animated thing, that's a lie, I'll footnote that. The first memorable character that I did was in New York where I was on the radio. And they had a thing called the Zoo Bus. It was a bus that went to the zoo. How'd they come up with that name? And on the bus, there were some talking animal heads. It was an uh, elephant and bear and lion. I was the ape, and the uh, ape sounded like Humphrey Bogart. Oh, I worked on my Humphrey Bogart thing, and I'm doing this movie, and the head would move, and it was an animated head in the bus, talking to the people in the bus. So that was, I would say, my first character that people actually had some exposure to. Um, then the first uh, freelance video voiceover gig that I did was a highly forgettable film, which you can still buy if you really want to called Little Tugs Big Adventure. It was live action footage of boats in New York Harbor, and I was the voice of all the male boats telling this story. Nothing new. And then the first animated anime role uh, was a demon fighter coach show uh, with the lovely David McGonagall, who was here earlier. earlier. Um, I played Professor Tomo. 
cute, but also a forgettable character. And then the first big TV animated role was the forgettable grandfather in Pokemon. So oh. large, large run of forgettable characters, of course. Question, question, question. Um, you were, uh, you were, and now you're Ella, right? Uh, yes. And you're also in Dinosaur King, right? Uh, I was briefly in Dinosaur King, replacing the late Maggie Glaustein, uh, who passed away suddenly. So I covered uh, her Helga, the main character. So I've done a lot of uh, housekeepers apparently in my career. Yeah. But yeah, that was fun. I'll try to get back. Bittersweet, but still enough. Questions? Questions? Every once in a while, I talk to myself a lot when no one's around. It's just because. And once in a while, I will speak about myself in the third person. Because it's fun. Questions? 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 Did you meet a lot of voice actors? There, uh, we have a... Voice actors have a passing relationship with each other. Uh, Bill had touched on this earlier. Because, especially in dubbing stuff, we record in isolation. So, people are stacked, like a doctor's office. You know, you hear from 2 to 2.15, 2.15 to 2.30. So, you see people maybe in a waiting room, or someone's leaving while you're coming in. Um, occasionally, we'll have, like, cast parties and stuff. Back in the, before all the whole recession and stuff, uh, four kids have rap parties when the show's rap. So, uh, Ultimate Muscle had a very cool rap party, and some of the writers who I never meet, they just read their script. Oh, you just died with me, I was going to need it. Thank you. Um, and occasionally, you get a Christmas party or birthday party or something. But, yes, I see people in passing. No, I don't see people enough. There are things like this. Hey, I haven't seen Bill in here. Bill's here. Um, but, for example, flying out to LA to meet my uh, LA friends who, yes, I've worked with on the Sonic games for two years. We've never communicated ever. I'm Facebook friends, but... Friend, what does that mean? Um, but again, it was a working day. We had a dinner, we had a recording session, and bye. So, not nearly enough. Question: uh, If you had to describe the size of the voice actor community in America, would it be small, large? Is it a lot of you guys, or is it a few people that do a lot of different roles? It's a lot of people, but it's a tiered situation. There are a few people at the top of their game making tons and tons of money. Then there's the medium, which I would say would be, oh, the knees, the bills of the world. I, I hate to speak for Bill, but but there's the there's the head of the beer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there's, there's, a, there's a multi side and now that I, I'll need to work on. But there's the medium tier, and then there's the internet, which has opened up the world of voiceover to anybody with a microphone and a computer in a quiet space. And you can audition online and get jobs. And I hate to call that the dregs, the lower tier, the bleh, because I actually do, I book work on the internet too, as time permits. But anybody with, um, with a quiet space and a microphone and who is willing to work at perhaps below the prevailing wage, um, they can work too. So it's gotten a lot more competitive. But again, at a certain level, it's less competitive because there are only certain people who are real that will travel to a studio to do this as opposed to, I'm getting home in my underwear and I'm recording stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Have you ever been in a musical set before you switched to 4Kids? No, all the people from 4Kids I met have 4Kids. That's a lot. Hey, I'm listening to myself and suddenly realizing I'm lying. I will take full credit for Michael and Nicholas becoming one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the uh, early 2002, 3, 4, whenever it was. I worked for him, and I had gotten to four kids by answering a classified ad back in the days when there was a printed newspaper and he sent sets in. Sorry, I'm old. Um, and I sent in my audition tape and got my Pokemon gig, and I led to more for oh. four kids. And I was recording a thing with Senator Nicholas and mentioned, no, I'm doing a thing with four kids now. I'm doing work with it. Really? That's hard to get into. You know, yeah, I heard they're auditioning the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles there, he says. I haven't heard that. Uh, maybe you could get me in for that, he said. I suppose. Come on in. I'm going there anyway. So I dragged him along, got an audition. He booked the role of, the, of Leonardo. And you're welcome. Uh, so yes. So there are some people then that, that um, actually all of uh, the people that worked with him 
before they were four kids, and then he brought them over as well. So I'll take full credit for their careers. <laughs> but yes, so I met a lot of people that had four kids in the first place, and then once I introduced that connection, four kids people went to an NYAB post and vice versa. Question? And you're Langston from the other now, right? Yes, I was. I guess I still am in a recording. You can't escape from going to parties forever, Fergie. Yep. Nice to look at those. He was fun. Yeah. The closest to my actual voice that I've ever done is a character, which was weird for the first thing. What's the character? Oh, it's me? Oh. Okay. Questions? My kids might say I'm like Dr. Eggman when they're not behaving properly. <laughs> so that yelling comes out a lot. Um, but I would like to probably say like the code is, is closer to just me in real life. Just the best parts of my life, the happy go lucky part of my life. Um, question? Question? Uh, like I you kinda just mentioned it, you kinda just touched on it, but do you do your voices ever come out at random times based on like emotions? Because I know like some of my friends, they have like accents when they get really like emphatic about something. Does that ever happen to you? Like a Dr. Eggman scream will just come out? Like, yeah, again, the, like the, the disciplinary <laughs> yelling, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do with yelling when you get to that volume. So the, uh, the yelling at the children, is very much the Eggman yelling. And I realized that only after, because I started doing Eggman, Eggman when my eldest child was still young enough to not be yelling. And uh, then after I'd been doing Eggman for a while, and then the, oh, misbehavior started, and yelling that followed the misbehavior, and I said, oh, hey, that's Dr. Eggman. <laughs> that's funny. Two questions. How do you feel about uh, pre roll Pre-roll versus dubbing, the two basic schools of animation recording. The uh, big broadcast shows that you may love on network television, like The Simpsons and stuff, are all done as a relay. They record the audio, then they animate to the audio. Uh, the stuff that I end up doing more often than not, although I've done both, is dubbing, which is stuff that comes usually from another country. The animation's all done. We are replacing the voices after the fact. Um, having come from radio, um, I would actually prefer not to have to watch the screen when I'm recording because usually stuff is going on in my head. So I've got to remember if I'm, if, if I'm dubbing, even to this day, don't read the script so much. And, oh, there's fun by matching. Hey, I, but I'm reading it and there's A in my head. So given the choice, prelay would be the thing because the pure freedom of I can talk for as long as I want and you can't do a darn thing about it, it's much more free. Although, having done dubbing now, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I'm just, I'm fitting into the concrete confined space up here. So, given the choice, pre like, not that common. But for the, the commercials and stuff that I do, like The Annoying Mr. Sun, uh, that was done. Um, the character was animated, but his mouth wasn't done. So I saw his head moving, and then they would actually match the flap to what I reported. That was probably the best of all possible worlds. I see the character, I don't have to care about the mouth, it's in my head, now it's your problem. Who was your favorite character to ever voice? I like the voices that make me laugh. So, the voices like Mr. Mulder and Muscle, this is this trap of a voice, made me laugh hysterically. And having worked at four kids long enough, there were derivations of that voice. So for example, if you were one of the four people who watched Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, I was bone -Oh. And Bonaparte was sort of a more effeminate version of me. Same basic voice, a little more of that going on. <laughs> and then Gogo Riki was a slightly more intelligent version of me. So, a little less of the Brooklyn uh, Bronx sort of sound, but a second basic gravelly voice. And just that voice makes me laugh. And possibly the all-time favorite of Ella the Maid. The, my voice coming out of Ella the Maid's face, that is just his error. I still find that hard to believe. Question? Question? Question. Let me fill up some space by playing my demos. This is how I get. Hello, microphone. This is how I get somewhere. Um, the people that have not heard me, they need to hear a demo. So I've got some demos that are available on my website. It's a mic dot com. It's a mic. Demo section.
Now, for the more serious stuff, my commercial demo. We all lie about numbers. It's like one minute you're 35, and the next thing you know, bam, you're 29. Well, here's a number you'd be happy to admit. $1.67 a day for all your calls from home with the AT&T one-rate plan. It happens every day in refrigerators across the country. It's vegetable resuscitation, where emergency methods like peeling the soggy outer leaves off the lettuce must be used to save the tender heart inside. Unless, of course, you have an Amanda Easy refrigerator. You're having a cookout on your big brand new deck, but something's not quite right. Your friends raise their perfectly prepared burgers in silent tribute to you. Then reality sets in and it hits you. You don't have a debt. You could, though, with a home equity line of credit from PNC Bank. Art and Court specializes in caring for people in the early to middle stages of Alzheimer's. We have the expertise and experience to simplify and enhance your loved one's life and to help you find the peace of mind you deserve. You know, the animation demo is commercials, this one for animation, you'll actually hear bits of my earliest Pokemon episode, the boring part of it. The following voices you are about to hear are brought to you by the mouth and mind of my public. They are intended for immature audiences. No assembly required. Parental guidance is not suggested. <laughs> hey there, kid. It's the Easter Bunny. Here to remind you that Easter time is more than just melted chocolate bunny and smushed marshmallow peas. Don't be a fool! This is a divine ceremony to summon a spirit who fed me the sacred literature from ancient days. We have no choice. I wonder what's keeping place. Dinner's almost ready. You believe me when I tell you that I live in the future, that I fly around in spaceships and I was crying genetically frozen for 10 years, but you have trouble believing my name is Meat! The world is a much different place today than it was when I started the business, Ash. We just can't compete with airplanes and email. Before I brought you to this island, you were nothing but human garbage. But now, I have recycled you, given you work sifting through the refuse that the city stupidly squashed. Starship Air Force One. It's like your mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations on Canada's Star Trek. You know, you guys ought to get along better. How about something more dynamic? Perhaps a pose like in Shadrian. Hi, this is Mama Hillway, champion of the world of my fashion. I don't understand what the man about fighting me and with my dad with this and she's back. Well, on this next side, we need to think about whether love is what came to the rescue. You may have got the drop on me, but a Star Warrior like King Cosmos don't surrender to nobody! Did you nip in the night? Did you back down the roof? Then you give me a call! My name's Dr. Pursuit! The creatures have freed themselves! Alex's voice was not harmed in the making of this report. <laughs> <laughs> I just came question in a moment, but first I was reminded. Listening to the clip of the garbage man, who was uh, the one from the Ninja Turtles, before I brought you to this island, I was reminded uh, of uh, the fun little techniques you can use in recording voice. Uh, he was basically a big, disgusting character that lived in a garbage dump. And they said, we want him to be big and disgusting. And I was very uh, pleased with myself at the audition. Uh, it was one of the earliest auditions of four kids, and the producer, uh, who was arranging the auditions, didn't know me very well. So I walked into the studio, me looking like me, and talking like me, and all of a sudden the audition began. Before I brought you to this island! I said, where did that come from? <laughs> it's what I do. But the actual recording session, they wanted him to sound like he was drooling. So I recorded him to say, a little bit of water, like this. <laughs> Before I brought you to this island, you were nothing but human garbage. <laughs> That's the kind of fun you can have. Question. Um, it kind of looked like you were competing uh, for one of the ones. Did you ever play anything in, uh, in, in Kirby? I was in Kirby Right Back Gacha. Lovely Ted Lewis was uh, King DVD and S. Ragoon. But in uh, Kirby Right Back Gacha, I was the mayor, uh, Mayor Len Blustergas. Um, as mayor of Cappy Town, I firmly believe that something. Um, and I was uh, Samuel the bartender, one of the, uh, the accent questions. I was, of course, your technical language bartender. Because they said, come up with a voice. But I guess I'm going to the technical. Um, I was a bunch of bit parts. Uh, uh, General Kit Cosmos was from the, uh, was in the demo. Uh, I was, uh, who else was I? 
in current media? I don't really know. But I was supposed to make parts of the recurring roles for the mayor and the court. Questions? 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 You were, uh, regret, uh, regret doing four kids, because, I'm sorry, this stuff sucks. Four kids sucks. That's very common thinking, but I have no regrets. The work that I personally did was... Yours is good, but, I mean, theirs sucks. Yeah, but again, there. The, the, the argument goes that Four Kids is in the business of, of internationalizing their show. So they make sure that it's not real Japanese, which I know that, that fans hate, sorry. Um, but they want to make sure that it can play all around the world so that they can license the stuff and get the most bang for their licensing buck. So they do make some changes that are not very popular. Also, they're dealing beyond broadcasting. I don't know if this question has been asked yet, but like, what do you think of how like, Four Kids uses the same voice actor for a lot of voices. Well, if you're that voice actor who's getting yeah. doing a lot of voices, it's quite good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, they had uh, at their um, height of production, I guess, a fairly limited uh, talent pool for the leads, but that may speak more to the uh, number of talented people. New York is full of very talented actors, but the actors who can be very talented at doing voices for cartoons is a slightly smaller number. So they were working with the best talent that was available at the time. So it's obviously better to be doing a lot more work because there's a lot more work. And it's cheaper because uh, they're paying you by the hour. So if you can do five characters in an hour instead of just one, hey, you just save a little bit of money that way. So it works better from a business standpoint, which not being a businessman in any organization, not really my problem. But I can understand why they do it. But I would happy, be happy for more people that I know to get work there if there was more work there. Question. When, these, when they have these, the different, the Disney movies and all that, or the animate, animations, and then they have these big name actors that come in and do this stuff. I mean, they, they get like paid really ridiculous amounts of money to pay themselves. Most person? likely, yeah, because there's a thing with the union, the, the Screen Actors Guild slash American Federation of Television and Radio Arts, artists, SAG after for short. Um, there's the scale rate, which the lowly rank and file doing union work will get paid, which is not a bad sum of money, but the big name talent with the big name agents and the big name negotiations will get paid large amounts for an animation. And it's not going to be as much as an on, big on screen part. But I believe Chris Rock said it best, not his recent <laughs> comments about it, not much work for the economy. But his previous comments about dubbing where he said, kids don't care about a celebrity doing the voices. They don't care if it's Chris Rock doing the voice. They go into the movie. I happen to agree. <laughs> so yes, hire the people who do this for, for a living because it's money. Questions, final questions? We are on the end of the day. All right then, thank you so much. I'll be signing stuff if you want to sign stuff. <laughs>